Hi everyone and welcome to the Aircraft Certification Channel. I'm Clarissa Fedel and together with Rafaela Cayo, we create this space to connect people that like us are passionate about aviation. So if you like aircraft development and certification, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to be advised every time that we upload a new video. Today, I will interview Fabi Stabile about bleed duct rupture particular risk analysis. Fabi was here with us before talking about fuel inert gas system and air conditioning system. So if you want to see this video, you can uh, watch this now with the link that will appear on your screen. Welcome aboard and enjoy your journey. Hi, Fabio. Uh, thank you for being here with us again. Welcome aboard. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, for who the, that uh, doesn't have the opportunity to see your, your video before, can you introduce yourself before we start? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer and I work for 18 years with development and certification of air management systems. Today we'll be talking about uh, bleed duct uh, rupture, a particular risk analysis, right? Can you explain what it is and what it is, why it is necessary? Well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, we need to explain what is bleed system, uh, or in other words, the pneumatic system. Uh, the bleed system is, the res is responsible to provide compressed air extracted from engine compressor or, or APU compressor to the consumers in the aircraft, such as air conditioning system, uh, anti-ice system, door seal, pressurization system, uh, inertization system, in some aircraft, uh, windshield and tax windows heating systems, uh, windshield wiper systems in some specific aircrafts, some heating systems, for example, cargo heating system, floor heating system, uh, pressurization of portable water systems, uh, actuate some some systems that require compressed air for actuation. Uh, in this picture uh, that you can see on the screen, uh, you can see the overview of uh, the routing of the uh, typical pneumatic system across a typical commercial aircraft. So you 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 can see that it inter interconnects the engine and APU with the consumers by using a duct system. Okay, uh, it seems that the bleed is essentially hot and high pressure compressed air, right? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, this is hot, hot air and hot air can damage aircraft in case of failure of these ducts. Um, this picture show a view of engine bleed ports uh, in this particular picture, the engine bit ports are, are tapped, and uh, th this is the location where when the bleed is extracted from. You can see that uh, it is installed in the case of engine compressor section. Uh, this other picture that you can see uh, shows a typical APU. Uh, it's possible to observe that. Uh, uh, APU usually has uh, only a centrifugal compressor and the bleed port is installed downstream combust combustion chamber. In the case of the combustion chamber, so this is this, this red tap is blocking the APU uh, is the extraction point uh, which bleed is taken from. I interviewed the um... Uh, Bernardo Franco about the, the bleed and uh, there's a lot of things that is done to guarantee that the, all the components and the lines will not uh, have any kind of uh, issue. Uh, but anyway, you needed to consider that uh, the bleed can leak or uh, can have some rupture, uh, right? Uh, so how this leakage and why it's so important to, to verify that? Well, in specific case of Franco, Franco's videos, he, he told about design criteria, uh, but of course that uh, the duct can fail and can leak. Uh, 
we cannot predict exactly uh, things related to manufacture or installation, but well, in fact, the bleed is distributed at temperatures not higher than approximately 200 degrees C. It can be more in some specific cases, but let, let's uh, simplify the discussion. Let's uh, consider that it's distributed at 200 degrees C. Uh, this temperature itself is above the maximum temperature that the aluminum alloy withstands, for example. Uh, these alloys start to lose their strength prepared at temperatures above 120 C. Uh, electronics components do not withstand temperatures higher than 70 degrees C, for, for example, also. And composite material starts to have permanent degradation above 80 degrees C. Well, the majority of components inside aircraft will be damaged by bleed with exception to some parts that are specifically made to withstand the, the temperatures of the bleed, for example, the stainless steel, inconel, ceramics, and titanium. So these parts uh, have the, it, their melting points above, very, 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 very above the 200 degrees Celsius. And is there any certification requirement that cover this analysis this, this, uh, that, that needs to be done? Oh, yes, this is the subject of the video. Uh, the requirement is the CFR 14, FAR 25, 1103. And uh, this requirement says that uh, induction system ducts and air duct systems for turbine engine and auxiliary power units, bleed air duct systems, no hazard may result if a duct failure occurs at any point between the air duct source and the airplane unit served by the air. This is the requirement. Um, as you can see, we need to demonstrate that potential failure cannot cause any hazard for the aircraft. And what are the hazards? Well, the, the hazards are related to the, the, the potential damage caused by temperature. Uh, well, the damage to critical structures or metallic stru structures such as uh, aluminum uh, and composite structures. Uh, in normal operation or in failure case, the bleed, the bleed duct system cannot damage critical structures. Uh, the majority of commercial planes are manufactured with aluminum. Now we are we are we are seeing that composite materials are are are, are being more and more used in the aircraft. And well, the other uh, potential damage that bleed can cause is damage to critical systems. For example, uh, actuators, cable bundles. Uh, full lines, uh, hydraulic lines, uh, electronic boxes, sensors, and it, it, well, in normal or in failure case, the bleed duct system cannot damage critical systems. Um, and um, those bleed ducts that surround a few tanks, uh, and or it, either when the, it's routed in other flammable fluid zones, there's any particular concern? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, these concerns are covered by other requirements, such as, for example, the ignition inside fuel tank, uh, normal operation or leakage of bleed duct cannot cause ignition of fuel inside the fuel tank. That is the requirement CFR 14, FAR 25.981, A1 and 2. And the other requirement is ignition in fuel vapor zones. Uh, that in this case is the surface temperature of the duct system cannot cause ignition in vapor zones. That is the requirement CFR 14, FAR 25.863, A, B, 1, 2 and 3. Uh, but, but the analysis will cover everything. Normally, if we do an analysis for, for the aircraft, 
for, for structures, for critical systems. We put requirements to cover uh, not only the particular risk requirement, that is 1103, but also the 981 and 863. Okay, so um, when you perform the analysis that you mentioned about, you are covering the 1103, the 981, and the 863. So everything is covered in, the, in that. Yes. And, and what is the, the compliance method? So can you can you detail more and explain what, what uh, is done? The compliance method is a combination of several kinds of uh, means of compliance. But essentially, uh, they are, for example, uh, we show the design. So we, we make the design uh, elements for for protected aircraft. So, for example, we design shields, uh, we design, design walls and redundancies. Uh, we use special materials for protecting the equipment. We use, we use uh, insulations, and also we can do the we can show the compliance by uh, by designing the uh, protection system, for example. So, the simple explanation of the protection system serves as a compliance method. So we, we, we show that the protection system by, by description uh, can protect the aircraft, uh, critical systems and crit critical structures. And well, but is it the design, the simple demonstration of design is not the only mean of compliance. We have also engineer analysis. So we, we make simulation, a numerical simulation. Uh, and this numerical simulation can use uh, not only concentrate parameter simulation, but also distributed parameter simu simulation, like for example, computer fluid dynamics or finite element analysis. So normally we use computer fluid dynamics to, to check the potential damage of a leakage, and also, and and we use, also use finite element analysis to to show compliance with, for example, conduction of heat through the structures. So one one simple thing would say that we use uh, computer fluid dynamics to show compliance to 981, for example, and we use finite element analysis to show compliance to 863, for example that uh, implies in demonstrate that the touch temperature is not, not uh, higher, that can allow uh, ignition source. And also, not, not, we use also laboratory tests to verify the assumptions of the models. And uh, also we, we make laboratory tests to check the thermal behavior of some components. And the last mean of compliance uh, is the safety assessment and, uh, to verify the probability of the duct rupture, combine it with the failure of potential or, or of, of uh, sorry, with the failure of the protection means. Okay, so just summarizing, the means of compliance would be a combination of design review analysis, laboratory tests, and safety assessment, right? Right, yes. Can you, can you give us a, some, an example? Uh, because it seems that affect all, uh, all the way of the bleed that is routed in the airplane. So can you, can you give us an, an example about that? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, in this picture, you can see a typical example of bleed duct passing in front of a spar that separates the, the leading edge compartment of the wing from the fuel tank. Uh, as you know, SPAR itself is a, is a structure, is a critical structure. And in the, in the drawing, you can see that the, the SPAR is not only a structural element, but it separates the fuel tank wall. It serves as, as the fuel tank wall itself. Uh, in this case, we can develop a system that detects the leakage and shut down the bleed valve, for example, avoid that structure be damaged and fuel tank reach its ignition temperature. 
But we can use another means. For example, we can put shields, we can put insulation, and that, 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 that's it. That's the to design the protection to comply with 1103. But, but how are you sure that uh, yeah, is enough? So it's all design review is not enough, right? So what, what else do you do uh, in, this, in this particular example? Oh, the system needs to be designed to be as reliable and redundant, redundant in order to meet no hazard criteria. So we, we do this by des design analysis and by safety assessment. Uh, so we, we combine all these, these means uh, of uh, show compliance to demonstrate that the hazard, we, we meet the, the criteria of no hazard. Uh, in, the, in this other picture, you can see a leakage event warming up a critical electronic box. This box may be responsible for a critical function in the aircraft. In this case, sometimes the, the electronics can even be damaged by bleed, for example. Uh, but the resulting consequence cannot bring hazard for the aircraft. Uh, in this case, we have other means to show that we, we are confident that design is good. So, for example, we can do this by installing another redundant box with the same function in other compartment of the aircraft. This is one, one way to, to solve the problem. Okay, so in this example, uh, instead to prevent the effect, the compliance is by creating a redundance in the affected site. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, but um, anyway, you should stop the leakage somehow, right? Uh, to avoid damage uh, for other equipment or uh, permanent damage. Uh, right? okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, you, you, yes, you, you, you have systems to shut down. You cannot leak forever. Okay, so you, you need to shut down the system and stop the, the, the hot gas. Uh, but you can use many safety precautions. In this case, you can have a system to shut down. In case of leakage, you can have redundant box in other compartments, and even some critical electronic boxes sometimes have, her, have their own protection. Uh, when this failure mode is critical for them, so let, let's imagine in the world, uh, given uh, electronic box that con controls a uh, 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 critical surface. If uh, you have uh, the possibility of having any uh, wrong instruction being sent, being sent to the control surface in case of leakage, the designer of the box will uh, provide uh, overheat protection for the box. In case of leakage, the overheat protection will actuate and shut down the box before the box starts to cause hazard for the airplane. So in addition to the protection that the shutdown of the, the, the bleed system, you also have a protection in the affected side. Uh, so uh, in this case, to like to give some time for this protection actuator, uh, deflector would uh, also could help. Could be used as a design precaution or a compliance means. Uh, yes. Well, uh, we can use a shield, for example, to retard the warming up and give time to the protection designed to actuate. Uh, in some cases, we, of course, we can use. Uh, a shield to protect critical systems or critical structures while the leakage is not shut down by the protection system. Uh, well, there are many solutions. The application of particular one will be driven by each design. So, Fabio, it seems that there's many solutions that um, affect the, the design. So, that's many things that can be done, right? So that acting in the bleed side and, and or in the protection side for the systems. And uh, besides of that, besides all, all the analysis, you also mentioned that you perform a safety analysis. So in the end of all this, you also demonstrate that it's uh, improbable that this failure to occur, right? Yes. Oh. Uh, the, the, point, the starting point is the failure hazard analysis. So you need to, to know the criticality of the systems before you start design to protect them in the system and critical structures. 
Okay, so uh, that's a lot of work. Uh, and considering that now uh, the technology or the seems that the direction of the aviation is going to the more electric airplanes, do you think that all this uh, uh, bleed uh, duct failure you problem will be solved? What would be your well, consideration it, about that? Uh, well, people are saying that, well, in fact, bleed can severely damage the aircraft, but there are people that think that adopting more electrical systems will solve will solve this particular hazard once there will be no no more bleed. The first thing is that uh, the more electric aircraft architectures uh, are not exactly win the trade-off for full efficiency. So some air, some manufacturers in the world are keeping the bleed systems. Uh, and well, by the other side, in fact, electrical systems have other failure modes that conduct to high temperature and therefore all the concerns related to high temperature of the bleed extends to future uh, MIA architectures, uh, more electric aircraft systems and the design solutions are and compliance demonstration may be much, much similar. Okay, Fabio, thank you very much for being here with us again. And a very, thank you very much. Very interesting subject. Thank and uh, uh, I think that we have a, a lot of videos about the environmental control system. And it's very interesting to, to know more about this uh, particular risk uh, of the bleed, uh, bleed system. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, if you want to contact Fabio directly, his contact information is in uh, the description uh, area. I hope you like it and enjoy your journey with us.